Our next speaker is Sojourner Kincaid Roll. Sojourner is a poet, playwright, peacemaker, and community activist. She is the author of Common Ancestry and Black Street. Her work is published in a variety of literary publications, and she has a body of uncollected work, some of which has been choreographed for dance presentation and performed as theater. Her most recent publication is called The Yellow Mellow Global Umbrella. Her talk today is titled, How I Lost My Voice and Found It, A Poet's Journey. Let's give a warm welcome to Sojourner Kincaid Roll. First, let me say just a little bit more about what I do in the world. I am a poet. Uh, I live a little farther up north in Santa Barbara. And uh, in my community, I consider myself a public poet. So I, I write poems, I read poems, I host poetry events, I encourage other po poets. I also am a community activist. I'm very active with uh, many of the organizations in my community. And many of them, I am considered their in-house poet. So that's one of the reasons I like this idea of public poetry. And I feel like uh, what I hope is that the poems that I write are poems that a general audience will hear. And um, so, so that just saying that, um, you know, I've done a lot of things in the many years that I've been calling myself a poet, and, and probably they'll unfold. But I wanted primarily to tell you something about my background, how I came to poetry, and uh, how I feel uh, that is kind of like my, my life work. So I was born in a little town in the mountains of North Carolina. And uh, not too long after I was born, probably less than a year old, my mother her mother and uh, the rest of her family moved north. So we first we moved to Wilmington, Delaware, and then my mother and my grandmother and myself moved on and lived in New York. So um, I want to. So back when I was like three and four years old, I used to hear all these little ditties and all these little songs, and I would learn some of them. One of the poems that I learned from my grandmother and my mother was "Little Orphan Annie." It was another poem. This was another one that came out probably in the 30s, and uh, you know, they knew it and they taught it to me. Uh, little Orphan Annie came to our house to stay to wash the cups and sauces and shoo the chickens away and brush the porch. And I always had this little punchline, and the goblins will get you too if you don't watch out. And it was so each stanza was about something that a child had done that was disobeying their parents. And then they would disappear, or you couldn't find them, or they were gonna get some sort of punishment. So the goblins will get you too if you don't watch out. So when I was five years old, my mother, who lived in New York but worked every day, uh, decided that it was really difficult to have a five-year-old and to have to go to work and have to pay somebody to keep the little girl. So she took me back to our hometown to live for a little while with my uh, paternal grandmother, my father's mother. But shortly after I got there, of course, she discovered that I knew this little poem, and so she would get me to say it when there was people at the house. One night, we went to a program at the school and there, I don't know whether they said, anybody out there know a poem? I don't know. But for some odd reason, my grandmother said, go up there and say your poem. <laughs> so I just, little five years old, went up there and said my poem. And I knew a lot of the poem. It had about 13 stanzas. I probably knew maybe six or seven. But I said my poem. Well, the next day after school, uh, my friend from up the street, who was in about the second grade, came to our house and said that her teacher had asked her to come and see if I could come to school to mock with them to mock the next day and say my poem in their class. So the next day I got on the bus with the big kids, I went to school, I said my poem in the class, and not only did I say my poem in that class, I said my poem in every class in the school. And the school was like first through 12th grade because this was in the 40s, and uh, it was in the segregated South, uh, so with the colored school, so that was it, the first through the 12th grade. I went to every classroom and said my poem, and every classroom thought I was their guest. They all ordered extra orange juice for me, and they came, <laughs> they came looking for me. So I now say that that was my first uh, ta get time experience as a professional, as a, not a professional, but as a, a guest room, a classroom guest. And guess what? When I was 55, I was already calling myself a professional classroom guest. And I think that that's, in, that's very important because it's about the idea of how uh, a young person is shaped to become who it is they become. We hear a lot of people talk about, well, my dad wants me to be a lawyer, but I want to be a, a rosebush pruner, you know, whatever. <laughs> so, you know, it's like, uh, it's, it's not 
uh, all the time that a, a young person will be allowed to go in the direction to which they may be naturally drawn or have a passion about or feel so inclined. And ha I had no idea, of course, and neither did my grandmother, that I might have a future as a poet. In fact, during my whole time in school, first through 12th grade, nobody ever, ever, I very seldom read a poem in school. It wasn't big in those days. And never, ever did anyone ask me to write one. But I had the good fortune of being in my grandmother's care. And my grandmother was a very special woman in that she was a community activist. So when I was about to start the first grade, she had developed a dislike for the principal of the school in which I was to attend. And she declared, I'm not going to let another one of my children go to that school as long as he's the principal. So they'd gone to the superintendent of schools. They'd gone to the school board to no avail. So when school started, they started uh, a boycott. My grandmother led the boycott uh, <laughs> out in front of the school every day with the picket signs. And uh, I was at home because she wasn't going to let any more of her kids start that school while he was there. Well, fortunately for me, during the Thanksgiving break, something happened that nobody had been, ever been able to prove, but the principal and his wife left town. And, <laughs> and so I started school in December of the year that I should have started in September. Uh, so I had a good... Uh, grounding from a community activist. Not only was she uh, an activist uh, having boycotts and pickets, she was the president of the PTA for several years while I was in grade school. She was the first woman on the board of trustees at her church uh, while I was a little girl. So it, I was fortunate enough to have a role model in my life of someone who was active and outspoken and uh, encouraged me to do the same thing. I was like her really little live-in secretary. You know, I would run errands for her, go for, uh, <laughs> take notes from her from speeches on the radio when she couldn't be there for somebody that she liked to hear. Um, she was always pushing me forward either to be in church, to get up and participate in the program. Uh, she'd say, go on up there, speak up, speak clearly, stand straight. You know, you get these messages, but she was very specific that this was constantly what I heard. So that went really well, and by the time I finished the eighth grade, I think I had the lead part in our eighth grade play. I uh, was head of the honor roll. I was just, you know, progressing fine. But again, I'm in the mountains going to a segregated school, and in those years, the schools just were not, and probably you've heard stories about sort of the de deficiencies of the southern schools, especially the colored schools. So my grandmother wanted me to have a better education, so she sent me to live with a family member in another town where she thought where the schools had a uh, reputation for being some of the best in the country. Not only was I uh, way away from home and uh, most of the people that I knew, I was now in a school which, even though it was integrated because it was a military dependent school, there were maybe only 15 or 20 black students in the whole school. And this was actually my first experience going to an integrated school. I don't know what the, what the reason was. Maybe it's because I was in a large family and I, my, it wasn't my grandmother, you know, being my sort of the two of us just being together. I was in a large family now and I had responsibilities as a teenager. For some odd reason, my high school years were just a total disaster. So my 11th and 12th grade, by the time I finished the 12th grade, I thought that I might not even graduate. And I certainly didn't think I was smart enough to go to college. And uh, so I came back home to, uh, and ended up in New York, living in New York. And my first job in New York, oh, many years later, I had a lot of bad experiences in high school. I was actually gonna read you a poem which I wrote uh, many years later. But it is a high school poem, or one from that time when I lived in Germany. And uh, when I was uh, working on this, and I read this to, some, this, uh, to someone else, one of my friends, uh, she actually started, uh, she got very emotional because she said it mirrored her high school experience. And that's one reason why I've chosen to read it now. It's called Stolen Cherries. My virginity was not given, it was taken by a friend my father's peer, but yet a boy, uh, who knew I would not cry or tell, who knew my propriety would keep this secret very well. But now I tell because I know this is a story a million times told, the past and rights for crossing girls not far removed from ancient tales. Detach the veil and you will see we all are broken in our stride, and guilt becomes our shoulder bird as we search and search for some lost pride. And I think that poem kind of epitomizes sort of my teenage years for me. 
and the fact that I was no longer under my grandmother's watchful eye and that things happened to me that probably wouldn't have if I still lived with her. Uh, but I <laughs> was out on my own and, uh, you know, it went. so I went to New York. I got a job, fortunately, at the, Santa, at the uh, New York Public Library, my first job out of high school. It was really, really good because the New York Public Library, it's the one on 42nd Street, and uh, lots of people worked there, but I was a page. I started as a page, and many of the people who worked there were college students. So I was introduced to more, a different kind of conversation. People were reading books and discussing books. Uh, intellectuals, et cetera. I went to the theater, I went to concerts, I went to the museums. I could lead tours of New York. I got to know the cultural terrain so well. But I still didn't go to college. I might, maybe took a couple of classes here and there at a community college, uh, et cetera. But it wasn't on my agenda. <laughs> so that was a, a good time for me because it was learning, but I was a quiet, shy girl. I was always the one in the corner. The one that people say, oh, you're always so quiet. Uh, but you know, when I was 13, um, or entering puberty, just to go back a little bit, you know, the kind of things that girls heard those days was, don't talk so loud. Don't laugh so loud. Don't uh, talk unless you talk, don't speak unless you're spoken to. Don't answer the question unless somebody calls on you. You know, it was kind of like a, where I had been a really outgoing little girl, I really felt like I got shut down when I was in my teenagers, teenage years, for all of these variety of reasons, societal messages. And even later years, my grandma would go home and my grandmother says, you're always so sad. You always look so sad. You're always so quiet. But eventually, I think I got involved in the civil rights movement. And really, it was still just as being a good girl. The thing I'd always done was just follow orders, be obedient, don't speak unless I'm spoken to. So I got involved in the civil rights movement. But I still was the clerk, the secretary, the administrative assistant. But I also was organizing boycotts. Um, I worked for Operation Breadbasket in New York. Um, so then, maybe in my late 20s, after having been involved in the civil rights movement for two or three years, I, like generally as a, as a clerk or a helper of some sort, I moved back to North Carolina uh, with the idea that I was going to go to school finally. That was going to be my intention. So I did, I did, I went back there, moved back. I started junior college, but somebody offered me a job um, working on behalf of the developmentally disabled. And I became a child advocate and a patient's right advocate, basically speaking up for people who couldn't speak up for themselves. And it's probably when I feel like I started to find my voice, but it wasn't my voice I found, I was speaking in someone else's voice on their behalf. And that was just still part of, I think, the continuing script of being a good girl, uh, doing something that I could help uh, others with. You know, when you're growing up, you hear all these songs like, if I could help somebody along the way, then my living will not be in vain. Those kind of things get imprinted on you. And they really, I think, start to form your script for life. It's like. These are the kind of values that I have. Uh, if I can help somebody, or may the work I've done speak for me, or things like that. I think that, the, again, they're coming out of that idea that my grandmother had that attitude in her community, and that was what I knew, and that's what I was imprinted with, and so that's what I did. I worked on behalf of others. So more and more, I became a community activist. And, uh, even, and people would ask me to be a leader in one endeavor or another. In one junior college I was in, I was recruited to be the vice president of student government, the president of the Senate. Uh, when I was in um, my four-year college, I went to UNC Charlotte. I was a member of the student legislature. And uh, I started to, like I say, when I graduated college, I got uh, the highest award, but it was because I was involved in so many student organizations. Uh, Attorney General for Students' Rights, different stuff like that. I didn't internalize that so much. I didn't see that really as my personal story. I saw that as being my being a helper in the world or my doing the things that someone asked me, could I help them with? Um, I don't know when I start to, to turn that around, but I do know when I began to write poetry. I would always be at my friend's house and I'd say, I feel like I want to write a poem. And so they'd go dig in the drawer and find a piece of paper and a pencil, and then I would get it and nothing would come out. Eventually, a poem came out. It was this. Uh, cut my hair, washed my face, de-emphasized my eyes, covered my legs. Nobody notices my unadorned mind. And uh, that was kind of what I felt at the time. 
But there were so many people, you know, and you know, you'd say something, the quiet girl in the corner would say something and people would be shocked that you even had a thought or an idea or anything worth saying that was in a part of their conversation. So when I moved back to North Carolina, I think people weren't used to me being the quiet little girl in the corner. So they started to treat me as the outspoken woman in the room. <laughs> and I started to rise to the occasion. And uh, eventually, I uh, knew I wanted to go to law school. And I was enrolled in this, I had enrolled in the legal secretary program. And I took an applied psychology class. And the professor, who was a retired lieutenant colonel from the Army, I think, was teaching the class. And so and during the class, he discovered that I was really interested in going to law school. And he said, well, you, <laughs> if you want to go to law school, the legal secretary program is not going to get you there, because it was a technical program, and I needed to be in an academic program. So the next term, I transferred to the academic program. And the end of that story is that 10 years after I transferred over, maybe less, or first had the idea, I graduated from UC Berkeley School of Law. But it was, again, me kind of being moved forward by the forces around me and people encouraging me and uh, this, seeing something in me. Um, all of those things are, are what helped me keep moving forward. Because inside, I didn't really feel that I was up to it. I was really afraid to death to do all of those things, but I kept moving forward. I'd have jobs and people would say, well, we ask you to do this because you look so strong. And I'd say, oh my, how would they ever know how inside I'm so terrified? So anyway, so I went forward. Uh, it wasn't until I was in Berkeley and in law school that I really started to write poetry. And it was out of the pain of law school. I just had so much uh, deep inside of me that I wanted to express um, about my sadness that I started to write. And the Stolen Cherries poem is one I wrote during that time. And um, I think it was starting to hear other people say, in fact, someone else I uh, knew had written a play. And it was called, something had to do with ancient times and things that happened in ancient times. And that's what inspired that poem. Well, I wrote that poem maybe uh, 20, 30 years ago. I still read it. Uh, sometimes I, the Rate Prices Center, when they have an exhibit, will want to put it on exhibit. Um, I, uh, I've, had, I've done many things, been published many times. So I always say that was my first best poem. But I'm proud of it because I think that it represents the story of so many women. And I think that's really what gives me my personal permission to speak through poetry, is that I feel like my situation, my experience, mirrors so many other people's experiences. And um, it, um, poetry just became the way to do it and to legitimize that by, um, excuse me, I should have brought the water with me, to legitimize that by uh, continuing to do poetry, to continuing to urge and watch the world, observe the world, to write about the things I say, and to be very open to speaking on behalf of others and to represent others in what it is that I do. So that's why I feel poetry gave me my voice back. And uh, I feel very pleased and proud to be a poet. I am a poet. Thank you. <laughs>